I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Catherine Cruz Gutierrez, who I actually first met in 2014 as a SIASI student. She remembers that well, right? And so I refer to her as Cat. And actually that summer she was awarded the AAS, the Association for Asian Studies, Usa Mahajani Memorial Award. So after that, she became a PhD candidate, or she already was a PhD candidate at that time, at Berkeley, where she had actually already gotten her undergraduate degree and her master's degree in 2016, and she finished a PhD in 2020. Um, the title of the dissertation, The Region of Imperial Strategy, Regino Garcia, Sebastian Vidal, Mary Clemens, and the Consolidation of International Botany in the Philippines, 1858 to 1936. Kat presently is, and I'm quoting from her CV, assistant professor in the Department of History at UC Santa Cruz. And she's also affiliated, besides with their Southeast Asia Coastal Interaction Center, with their Science and Justice Research Center, and their Global and Community Health Program. So she has lots of hats in the fire, so to speak. Um, she also has forthcoming various things, which I won't necessarily read here, but I think there's at least three on the CV. Has any one of them come out yet? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> and she has manuscripts in progress, and her CV shows many awards, uh, fellowships, grants, and other things. And the one thing I wanted to, uh, oh, I, I did want to mention this. In this calendar year, 2021, she was on the shortlist for best dissertation in the Humanities International Convention of Asian Scholars. Is that any update? Still, it was the shortlist. That's it. Okay. <laughs> uh, one thing I never mentioned to her before, because I didn't know it until I saw it on the CV, was she says she knows Thai. So what do you There we go. <laughs> Which was a surprise, because I didn't know she knew Thai. Now I know she knows time. So I'm very pleased to have her speak on uh, this topic, which I'll let you all see behind me there. And again, if anybody would like to go to lunch with us afterwards, just meet over here. Thank you. Yeah. All yours. All right, thank you so much. Great. Everybody. Um, so good afternoon all, and I'm very happy to be here today, in part because of my own affection for the Madison campus. So I'm actually a two-time Siasi alum. The first time I attended Siasi was when I was an undergraduate student, intent on working in public health in the Philippines. Um, so career twists would actually turn me down a academic path, and I still owe my gratitude to my Siasi summers for the friendships and intellectual inspirations that I was able to get from them. So I really should be thanking Mary McCoy, B.C. Doty, and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies for arranging this talk. I also thank Larry Ashman, um, to whom I dedicated my MA thesis, and I did it out of spite. So <laughs> I had, he recalled this book that I really, really wanted, and I you know, angrily told him I'd dedicate my MA when it was done because I needed that book. Um, Michael Cullinane, who actually got me to study Spanish. Um, I don't know if you remember that conversation, but um, I probably couldn't have written this paper had I not actually really been intent on that study either. So thank you for that. The, the other Filipino language. The other Filipino <laughs> language. <laughs> Al McCoy, um, who also kind of encouraged me in history, and of course <laughs> Sheila Samar, um, who I now understand is not here anymore, but I give her my thanks to. All of these folks really encouraged my growth in Philippine studies, and it's really good to be back. So I'm going to first start our discussion um, by sharing a little bit about how I got to studying botany and the various questions that continue to guide me through my writing and research. And from there, I'll share a little bit about my current book project, uh, which will allow me to explain how I'm approaching the idea of international botany as a new imperial science formation. And this informs my thinking and really one of the principal contributions of a paper that I'm refining, not from the book project, but deeply related, on a late 19th century botanical text that was the work of Spanish colonial botany in the Philippines. I'll conclude my prepared portion of the talk after sharing from the paper, and we should have ample time for Q&A and for you to share constructive comments. And so I really, really welcome the constructive comments. 
So like I had alluded to, uh, I had worked in public health, specifically among Southeast Asian immigrant communities in Los Angeles. At the very start of my doctoral program, I had identified the history of public health as my possible avenue for doctoral research. Medicinal plants in particular hold a central role in Philippine public health. This might be the same in other locations in Southeast Asia. And it was in my haphazard research for historical studies on Philippine botany that I came across some startling patterns in how botany has been understood in the archipelago and by scholars of the Philippines. So I just share three here. So first, uh, Philippine botanists in particular have long celebrated the US colonial period of the Philippines as the scientific or progressive period for botanical research. Scientists love the work of Elmer D. Merrill, William Henry Brown, and Edwin Copeland, and so on, for prosecuting the most widespread and thorough systematic studies of Philippine plant life. And so this map here is from the Merrill Archives and Documents, where I'm currently conducting research that features the collecting itinerary of well-known Philippine plant collectors. You can sort of see where these are uh, focused. Everything pre-1898 has been viewed as piddly ecclesiastic and agriculturally driven secular attempts to comprehend Philippine flora. So that is everything during the Spanish colonial period, with the exception of Augustinian friar Francisco Manuel Blanco's Flora de Filipinas, a respected and well-studied Spanish area compendium produced in 1837. So this view mirrors what we know to be a very entrenched historiographical trend, not only for the Philippines, but for imperial studies broadly. So simply put, it's looked like scientific backwater Spain versus scientific behemoth US, or really any other European, northern European country. Second, and tied to the first, is the typical cast of characters that comprise the history of Philippine botany and really the history of Philippine science. Once again, we have Merrill Blanco, the Jesuits, Paul Freer of the US Colonial Bureau of Science, etc. And surely to my young mind, there had been many more individuals, especially Philippine-born intellectuals and laboring hands, contributing to colonial scientific endeavors. And third, I observed how plants, especially during the revolutionary foment of the late 19th century through the post-colonial period, became imbued with political fervor. This isn't unique to the Philippines, where plants helped demarcate territorial terrain. Botanists and politicos post-World War II especially have celebrated endemic flora as meaning-laden symbols, panacea, and crucial to reforestation. And so now I continue to find this last, last observation interesting because of the kinds of meanings that we imbue in plant life. And as we know, plants don't have the same loyalties that political projects may pursue. And so this got me thinking about all the ways that governments, people, and institutions lay claim to plant life. And so botany became a realm of knowledge that I became fascinated with, and really the totality of the history of science in the Philippines and my work thus far has been thinking about, one, thought trends for conceptualizing Philippine science, two, refiguring our typical cast of characters, and three, political projects and plants broadly. So presently, I'm working on a book project that examines vernacular plant knowledge in the Philippines at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. I focus on this time of imperial transition from Spanish to US colonial periods in order to yield a more symmetrical study of the science of botany across the 1898 divide, or when the US obtained the archipelago from Spain. Well, the 1898 divide has had its merits in understanding Philippine history. What a traditionally periodized project can do is obscure some very important continuities linking both imperial projects. Furthermore, botany at the turn of the century obtained a different character than what we know of from, its early modern, from the early modern period through the mid 19th century. And this new character was shared by Spanish and US botanists alike. In 1864, Anglo-European botanists established the International Botanical Congress, or the IBC, to convene plant specialists and to stabilize, among other practices, a system of nomenclature for the globe. So by the 1930s, inter intellectual international cooperation became the rallying banner 
under which the botanies of old and emergent empires agreed to exchange duplicate plant specimens, co-publish cereals, and standardize herbarium and nomenclatural practices across institutions. We see the emergence of political bodies, but likewise scientific ones, like the Ornithologists' Union of 1884, Entomologists' Union of 1910, the founding of the International Astronom Astronomical Union in 1919, and the International Geographical Union founded in 1922, but first conceived in 1871. And so the IBC was actually quite early compared to these other organizations, it formed again in 1863. So the IBC was just one of several multilateral diplomatic systems, as they've been called, that emerged during this time. It included botanists based in colonial territories, specializing in colonial flora, alongside botanists stationed in metropolitan research centers, and also what I've called botanical emissaries, voraciously collecting plants under no defined national banner. A pronounced ethos of international collaboration emerged that distinguished itself from early imperial competitions for plant material and plant knowledge. Atlantic studies scholars have examined the espionage, secrecy, and piracy taken up by Spanish, British, French, Dutch, and Portuguese courts and explorers. But international botany touted itself to be different standardization of nomenclatural norms, fair exchange, affordability of cereals, and the end to intellectual schisms were the expectations of the science as it was internationally and quite loftily conceived. But what we know of, this very, of the very first conveners of the IBC and the most influential were Anglo-Europeans hailing from Europe and the United States and eventually from South Africa and also Japan. In my own work, I suggest that interests of empire simply took a revitalized form. So I use international, inter-imperial, and really new imperial interchangeably to emphasize the logical continuity of universalizing knowledge claims and hoarding the totality of it. This was not altogether distinct from the Linnaean ambitions of 18th century Europe. It was just under a new veneer, a collaborationist ethos one that Spain and the United States both evinced at the turn of the century. In other words, if we zoom out a bit from the entrenched simplification of Spanish colonial science versus US colonial science, we see a continuity manifested through an international practice and vocabulary and made clear in the Philippines. So drawing from this, the paper that I'm developing, in the paper that I'm developing, I argue that by the late 19th century, Spain advanced a scientific statecraft as peninsular officials began to exchange colonial botany information with emerging European empires. They did so by broadcasting the innovative botanical work conducted in the Philippines, especially that found in the 1883 publication, Synopsis de Familias y Generos de Plantas Leñosas de Filipinas, or Synopsis of Family and Genera of Philippine Flowering Plants, written by Catalan botanist Sebastián Vidal y Soler, and illustrated by a mestizo Philippine artist, Regino García Ibasa. I argue that the scientific statecraft can be seen through a visual grammar um, and artistic ingenuity unseen in other contemporary botanical publications of the time. By the late 19th century, Spain attempted to refashion itself as an intellectual heavyweight that could stand equal to other European states. Garcia had an important place in this effort, not only as an employee of the Spanish scientific outfit in the Philippines, but as its most long-standing experienced functionary with both botanical and artistic acumen. As Rasil Mojares has written, there was no decade of the intellectual history of the Philippines that has been as productive and impactful as the 1880s. Mojares cites several illustrative publications from the decade, including Jose Rosales, No de Metangere, a must read in every Southeast Asian Studies classroom. I'm sure everyone has read it by now, right? Uh, the books of Pedro Paterno, Isabella de los Reyes, and Trinidad Puerto de Cavera. And to this library, I add Vidal and Garcia's synopsis. So for the paper, I specifically conduct a formal analysis of Garcia's atlas, which is comprised of 100 lithograph plates depicting roughly 1,900 plant figures. And I read this analysis alongside archival records of the Jardim Botanico de Manila, 
or the Manila Botanical Garden, and the Comisión de la Flora y Estadística Forestal, the Flora Commission for short, two institutions primed to survey and catalog Philippine plant life for agricultural, commercial, intellectual, and as we shall see, imperial diplomatic ends. I compare Garcia's illustrations to others he completed on behalf of the Augustinian-backed issue, reissue of Blancos Flora de Filipinas, which in Philippine studies has actually been a very well-studied text. And I also compare those to his illustrations to other illustrated national, natural science publications of the time. I demonstrate how synopsis captures the apex of secular Spanish colonial botany at the end of the 19th century through its visually distinctive and classificatory quality. An apex made realizable through local expertise. Synopsis further enacted a novel mobility for Spanish colonial botany and Philippine plant life through Gar Garcia's artistic techniques. An invitation for heightened imperial scientific investigation, synopsis became a tool to further intellectual undertakings in tropical terrain. And so I agree with empire historians who show how policies, ideas, and scientific knowledge move beyond the triple colony axis and were in fact exchanged along new circuits of this new consolidating imperial world of the turn of the century. I think Al McCoy has written on this. And as I make clear in this paper, this internationalist impulse began as early as the 1870s and 1880s among colonial botany officials working in the Philippines. For the case of Philippine botany, circuits of intellectual exchange not only included the archipelago in Spain, but also German and Italian empires looking to capitalize on the promise of colonial expansion in the floristic region known as Malaysia. Uh, it's also pronounced Malaysia, and spelled M-A-L-E-S-I-A, -E which we currently understand to be a larger floristic region comprised of island Southeast Asia, peninsular Malaysia, and Thailand, and part of New Guinea, depending on the botanist that you ask. And so with these considerations in mind, I contribute a significant artful text to the history of Philippine science, to Iberian colonial history, and to how we can think about Spain's participation in international science that hinged on personnel working in the Philippines. And so the Jardín Botánico de Manila was established in 1858 and had an incredibly slow start. The history of this institution is it's hilarious, it's sad, um, I'd be happy to talk about it elsewhere. The garden had been the brainchild of agriculturalists and financiers associated with the Philippine Royal Economic Society that was then taken up as a beautification project of the Governor General of the Philippines. The peninsula labored to find suitable Spanish candidates to send to Manila to lead the garden and had denied candidates who failed to show theoretical expertise in botany. The selection committee behind Manila's botanical garden director included two of the leading Spanish botanists, Miguel Colmairo and Vicente Cutanda, who were at the forefront of expanding the discipline in the mid-19th century. Funding for natural history had been slim and inconsistent under Isabella II's turbulent reign, but her overthrow in 1868 ushered a revival of botany and its participation in European circles. For the Philippines, the liberal sea change could be felt, though this wasn't only beginning with the Glorious Revolution, and in fact started developing earlier in the 19th century, as others have studied. The Botanical Garden began with a single Iberian director, but before the director's arrival, the local colonial government had hired Regino Garcia to assist with the development of the garden grounds. Garcia was born in Manila in 1840 to a peninsular from Madrid and a Spanish Tagalog from Manila. He came from elite Manila, having trained at the Nautical School and at the Academia de Dibujo y Pintura, or the Academy of Drawing and Painting. Garcia had no previous training in gardening, botany, or agriculture, but likely assumed the post because of his surveying skills and because of his social standing. So some of her first evaluations as an employee suggested his unremarkability in his post noted in his Oja de Servicios, or Record of Government Service here. So this particular source, uh, historians find, um, was fortunately preserved in Madrid, since records of the garden and most other materials on Spanish colonial botany in the Philippines had been lost to fire and artillery destruction at the end of the 19th century. The files of Philippine-born personnel were likely held in Manila, 
but we're really lucky that this one was actually preserved in Madrid. So this record noted how Garcia was more highly regarded for his artistic skill. His talent earned him a place to study in Madrid at the Escuela de Bellas Artes de San Fernando through a pensionado program or scholarship program overseen by the Art Academy. In 1870, Garcia would have sailed to the peninsula ahead of the better studied artists like uh, Juan Luna and Felix Hidalgo. But political unrest on the peninsula and the death of Garcia's colleague, who had also been accepted to the program, foiled his departure. He stayed in Manila, resumed studies at the Art Academy, and continued employment at the Botanical Garden in order to financially provide for his younger siblings. Now, what I find remarkable about Garcia um, and his career in botany is that even if he fell into the field because of necessity and circumstance, he ended up carrying the longest institutional memory of secular Spanish botany in the Philippines because he outlasted peninsular and other local employees. The garden's institutional history and that of the forestry service of the Spanish, the Inspección General de Montes, is replete with death and employee turnover. Functionaries often spent only a handful of years in the archipelago and either died in the field retired to the peninsula, and rarely spent the rest of their careers in the Philippines. So some of the saddest archival research I saw, I mean, it was death after death after death recorded um, in the forestry archives. But the Manila-born Garcia, in this respect, had a local's advantage. His family, social ties, and intellectual standing compounded as the leadership of the garden and the forestry service changed. He also experienced professional mobility, reserved for the elite few at the time. His career lasted into the 20th century when he served the US colonial administration and transitioned in the new botany outfit, not unlike other well-studied studied illustrados who made such similarly consequential and political intellectual moves. He learned taxonomy conventions, plant identifying work in horticulture on the job, and he grew familiar with Philippine plant life, ghost compiled publications, and facilitated expeditions throughout the archipelago. And so he also started to deploy his artistic skills, as shown here through this rough sketch of Quisquisales Indica. Garcia has been described as, quote, an uncommon breed of artist naturalists seen in the late 19th century Philippines. And indeed, at the end of the 19th century, the Philippines saw a crop of artist naturalists, that is mostly men, working in oils and who depicted plants. This coincided with the reopening of the Academia de Dibujo in Ipentura, the Academy of Drawing and Painting, and the expansion of colonial botany. Illustrations of Philippine flora had by no means been absent earlier in the Spanish colonial period. Early modern naturalizing of the Philippines has a visual archive, but many of these were unpublished, used for commercial intents, and remain in tomes and did not circulate widely. But by the late 19th century, illustrated publications on Philippine plants signaled a shift in the way in which the Spanish state exchanged information. As exemplified through publications produced through the Comisión and functionaries of the Forestry Service, illustrations contributed to a collective empiricism of which colonial botanists in the Philippines could see themselves apart. An illustration can serve as the actual exchanged material while representing aspects of nature for empirical study along shared metrics of scrutiny and assessment. Moving away from the once intellectually secretive practices, as the Spanish monarchy had been wont to command, widely distributed illustrations evidence Spain's eager participation in international botany. During this time, the Comisión and eventually the Forestry Service, Garcia collaborated mostly with Sebastián Vidal. They were remembered to have a dear friendship, one you can only imagine gets struck when you spend days on botanical expeditions and hours of the herbarium and moments of respite in a garden by each other's side. Vidal, here, has been regarded as Spain's most prolific secular botanist in the Philippines. He trained in forestry in Germany and was deployed to the archipelago in 1872 and had the privilege of having some of his family in Manila as well. His brother Domingo also resided in the capital and it was Domingo who oversaw the four volume revision of Blanco's Flora de Filipinas which sported the illustrations that some of us are familiar with if you're in Philippine studies, and for which Garcia was actually the lead illustrator. 
Vidal and Garcia's collaboration not only extended to expeditions in Luzon and parts of Mindanao, it also included the synopsis. Vidal prescribed the boundary of rigorous botanical study by denouncing a, quote, eclecticism that plagued other botany publications. Rejecting such eclecticism, according to him, was necessary. For 19th century European botanists, especially those who worked in colonized territories, coming across unfamiliar, non-temperate plant material, to maintain the philosophical value of systematic botany. In turn, Synopsis allegedly subscribed to the most rigorous and updated arrangements of plants at the time. This was the Bentham and Hooker system. Garcia completed all the illustrations and lithographs. And then the Atlas's index indicated the collecting locality of the illustrated specimens in order to, quote, facilitate verifications, according to Vidal. Vidal, therefore, had envisioned the work as a possible guide for further research. This was not only an invitation made to peninsular or overseas Spanish botanists. He had been currying the favor and attention by previously translating German works into Spanish and by paying visits to London and Leiden to collect literature to stock Manila's gardens library. The synopsis can be seen as an illustrated publication that could be mobilized more readily than perishable live plant material or fragile herbarium sheets. Forestry employees remitted plant specimens to Manila and Vidal and the Comisión, remitted herbarium sheets to the Royal Botanical Garden of Madrid and elsewhere. Herbarium sheets functioned as material for exchange, especially to shore up collections of colonial and metropolitan repositories. But illustrations from the Philippines could visually transport more structures of a typical plant specimen that can reasonably be sent internationally. So instead of single specimens, however, the images of synopsis feature species and representative plant structures of entire plant families. While it was typical of the synopsis genre in the natural sciences to explore shared characteristics among members of the same taxonomic family, Garcia's visual representation of plant material was uncommon. And so for instance, a weedy 646 page flora from Paris, published in 1876, around the same time had no illustrations. And Garcia's style was also unusual of Spanish colonial botany in the late 19th century, and no other colonial contemporary from, say, Cuba, um, Puerto Rico, or even Guam actually offered such a display. There wasn't really as comprehensive of studies coming out of these locations. On the peninsula, two major synopses immediately preceded Vidal and Garcia's, an entomological synopsis of 1876 by Ignacio Bolivar, and a synopsis of fossil species in 1878 by Lucas Mayada. So uh, this is one from the uh, Bolivar work. Uh, but Bolivar's work only featured seven illustrated plates. And Mayada's work on fossil plants um, work was kind of only had 36 plates, so this was quite small. And the plates in Bolivar's and Mayada's publications also present structures arranged in a relatively linear, horizontal, or vertical fashion. You can sort of see here, right? In the way that they're arranged. It's pretty simple. Uh, this resembles the presentation of plants in Synopsis Philicum, which was published in 1883 by English botanists William Jackson Hooker and John Gilbert Baker. Burn structures are boxed and segmented by genus. As you can see here, Garcia's style erodes altogether this kind of visual organization. So let's get into his images. Blam! So on a single plate and synopsis, Garcia captures plants' reproductive stages, combines several species reported as members of the same family, and does so with less linearity of arrangement. These images present more than just one species for purposes of comparison, while almost also demonstrating the classificatory capacity of Garcia, Vidal, and the Comisión. Artistically, the plate departs from a more two-dimensional aspect, as you saw, that had characterized many other natural history texts from elsewhere. By also illustrating the structural resemblances within a single family, Garcia presents an updated approach to colonial botany in the Philippines that until that point, had either not published thorough images or had ventured to provide only single species illustrations. So here, this is the same image, we have the plate for the Euphorbiaceae family. Um, and it illustrates actually the species of eight different genera 
So there are eight different species of here from eight different genera, and you can see that here. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, all right? And so uh, for species A, Melodus malaconus, Garcia includes an example of a branch in bloom right here in the middle. He also has uh, what we would consider a male flower that's bloomed. This is the fruit of that same plant and then a cross section of that fruit here. What's curious is that he has uh, a leaf that's also been detached from you know, segment A. So we can look at the leaf a little more closely. We can see the midrib and the veins of that leaf. He's also folded up this leaf so we can look at the underside of that leaf. Um, you need to look at the underside of leaves generally. I mean, this will help with identification. Mind you, if you do not have an herbarium specimen to actually look at the bottom side of a leaf, kind of helpful to have this in an illustrated form. You can also see here in the background another uh, upturned leaf, so you can observe the mountain side. He tends to favor fruits and seeds and also shows inflorescence of some of these species. And so we see little flowering portions of other species here, also here, and another here. And what's curious is that he also separates with faint dashed lines. Again, these aren't necessarily vertical and horizontal. But what really takes our ocular focus is really species A. And then kind of more miniature focus here are these other species as well. I also really like the cross sections. They're quite careful because not only are there cross sections of fruit, but you can also see the insides of seeds. Most of the plates in Synopsis contain a visual abundance of plant material crowded to the edges of each printed page. Garcia and Vidal may have done this in part for sensible purposes. Printing an illustrated survey of Philippine plants was costly. The publication of Spanish colonial forester Ramon Hordana's 500-page natural history sketch of the Philippine archipelago published in 1885 required at least 1,500 pesos for printing in Madrid and only featured 12 lithograph plates. Remember, the synopsis has 100. This was for Hordana's publication. This was 150% the total budget for materials in the Comision's first year of operations. Vidal and Garcia also likely chose a local publisher for purposes of proximity and cost. The Manila publisher of Synopsis, Chofre y Compañía, or Chofre and Company, was a popular Manila-based publishing house at the time, producing children's publications, civil reports, and other documents of the Comision. With lithography at the commission's disposal, Vidal and Garcia could produce more copies of Synopsis and its atlas at a faster rate. By October 1883, at least 106 of the 250 copies planned for distribution were sent to libraries, research centers, specialized schools, and press houses. Garcia's illustration style could have contributed to the overall lower cost of the synopsis, which helped make the work more accessible. Printed with no color, synopsis has, was not only cheaper to print, but also cheaper to buy. Compared to the four-volume revision of Blanco's Flora de Filipinas, um, synopsis illustrated more individual structures and presented botanical classification. Flor de Filipinas has been remembered as, quote, the crowning glory of Philippine art and science in the colonial era, end quote, because of its botanical erudition and colored illustrations. In 1876, the Agustinians initiated the reissue, which was placed under the editorial direction of Domingo Vidal, as I had mentioned. While the text of the revised editions was printed in Manila, the 477 colored lithographs were printed in Barcelona. The Agustinians paid 73,000 pesos for the entirety of the project, a sum that was more than double the personnel costs of the Comisión in its total of eight years of operation. So this is to say it was a very, very expensive Catholic-backed project. The Flora de Filipinas was prohibitively expensive for individuals, and it cost is evident in the sumptuous style of illustration. So like I had mentioned, Garcia was the lead illustrator also for the Flora de Filipinas, okay? as well, uh, and he was joined by other specialists and artists at the time who were also in Manila. So this is Garcia's plate for the Osimum Americanum, and centered in the front on the page is a flowering branch of O. Americanum. 
the illustration itself is actually quite dynamic. So while some flowers have fully bloomed, some are still in bud form, and while the images of Flora de Filipinas do not depart considerably from the conventions of natural history illustrations, when compared to the images of Synopsis, they reveal the opulence of negative space and color, both by Garcia. Even in the absence of color and negative space, Garcia's plates, plates for synopsis utilize considerable technical skill to present organized structures in service to classification. While cost may have been a contributing factor behind the visual production of synopsis, much should be said of Garcia's compositional capacity making the atlas a work of science and art. And again, you know, the way that I've sort of interpreted it once more is sort of look at these individual species, it's all well and fine. It doesn't exactly point to a lot of the developments that are happening in botany largely, um, especially at the end, second half of the 19th century. Um, and all of this space, I mean, this is prime real estate here for printing, but that goes without saying that you know, these aren't fully printed pages compared to the synopsis, which again was uh, a much more affordable project, publication, and cost less on the whole. The profusion of plant specimens on the plate may gesture less towards financial circumstances of the entire project, but more towards the fecund Philippine environment. Compositionally, the plate communicates abundance of both colonial botanical research and plant life in the Philippines, as the structures seem more organically arranged, layered with a depth of field, and are unbound by linear, horizontal, or vertical orientation. The synopsis plates present the Philippine environment as lush, almost overwhelming. They compress plant structures for heightened scrutiny, reflecting the latest developments in international botany. And while the colored plates for Flora de Filipinas present the gems of Philippine plant life, they don't do so to spur family-wide investigation and to emphasize relation within the Philippine or Malaysian plant world. This kind of encouragement toward wider investigation of the regional tropical environment happened alongside the publication of Synopsis and continued well into the U.S. colonial period. So the Synopsis itself was also handsomely rewarded by the Spanish crown, and both Garcia and Bridal were honored for their intellectual product. By the mid-1880s, Philippine botany drew more acclaim from Euro European botanists engaged in Valencian study. In 1885, the Italian plenipotentiary in Spain appealed to the state minister for a copy of Flora de Filipinas, from which the colored image comes from, on behalf of Eduardo Bacari, a Malaysian plant specialist. Between 1877 and 1889, Bacari published a three-volume study of Malaysian flora drawn from fieldwork he carried out from 1865 to 1878. The plenipotentiary expressed Bicari's delight if he were to obtain a copy of Blanco's Flora from the Spanish government and offered Bicari's publication, Malaysia, in exchange. After the state minister communicated the Italian plenipotentiary's appeal, the Ministerio de Ultramar, or the Overseas Ministry, responded directly to the state minister and actually denied Bicari's request for Flora de Filipinas. The Overseas Ministry clarified the, the Flora de Filipinas was not a work of the Spanish state, but instead was the work of the Augustinians, and in its place they offered Vidal and Garcia's synopsis, one funded by the coffers of the Spanish state that was, quote, of no less import that could be very useful, end quote, to the Cari. While it would be too much to suggest that the Spanish state worked to stifle the inter-imperial circulation of Flora de Filipinas, it was, after all, a very, very expensive set of volumes. Its upholding synopsis as a product of the secular state is telling. The Spanish state's decision to distinguish its intellectual work from the Augustinians is therefore curious if we consider how the state may have been responsive to liberal developments on the peninsula and in the Philippines, in addition to great anti-clerical outcries emerging from the colony. For botany, specifically in Spanish scientific statecraft, was responsive to developments in the Philippines and worked to incorporate colonial intellectual production in its diplomatic relations with Italy. And in the end, Bicari gratefully provided copies of Malaysia in exchange for synopsis. Around the time of publication, Vidal had become a traveling functionary. So much so he garnered the envy of other Spanish officials who wanted to leave the Philippines as often as Vidal did. 
He translated German natural history on the Philippines, represented the Philippines and Spain at US and European expositions, and was awarded by Germany and the Netherlands for his work. Garcia too traveled with Vidal, namely to Mount Philippine exhibits in Spain. It was this very botanical initiative conducted in the Philippines that the Spanish state leveraged to present itself to other imperial states as a reinvigorated intellectual power, especially at such manicured imperial expositions. So in conclusion, I like to think of how this triptych, all of Garcia's work from the same plant family, mind you, reveals how the Spanish state refashioned itself as a scientific power on the acumen arising from a Pacific colony. This I've shown was best captured in the publication and Garcia's art unique artistic style that gave botany work a distinctive quality compared to other synopses published around the same time. Until the establishment of the botanical garden, the Spanish colonial state in the Philippines lacked the infrastructure to execute wider botanical investigations. In the triptych, Garcia's rough sketch encapsulates this. The sketch has not traveled very far from its archival home at the Rizal Library of Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. Unpublished, Garcia's sketch bears similarity to the images and botanical data collected by the early Spanish Empire in the Philippines that never met wide publication or distribution. By the late 19th century, however, this changed. The Flora de Filipinas plate exemplifies the meaning of both religious and secular scientific enterprise. This one right here in the middle, again, also by Garcia. But this plate acknowledges that the most significant advancements made in Philippine botany up until that point had been at the hands of botanizing missionaries. Even if the state and its secular art school supplied many of the artists to illustrate Blanco's flora, the work was still that of the Augustinians. The synopsis plate, however, signals a shift, one that could exemplify the intellectual might of the Spanish Empire accentuated by local Philippine virtuosity. A work completed solely by its secular colonial functionaries, the synopsis helped fashion the Spanish state as a scientific one. The synopsis plate communicates to a wider network of plant specialists and relies on a scheme of plant life that recognizes the structural resemblances. It encourages observers to visualize plants as part of a fuller relational whole based on taxonomic families that are understood to be expansive beyond a single colony's borders. The synopsis plate magnifies a sense of regionality, an acknowledgement that plants might bear similarity to others elsewhere and not just in one locality. This regional thinking pursued by botanists at the turn of the century would be just one of several orientations of new imperial botany. Japanese and US colonial officials would become known for these regional investigations. For the Japanese, this meant developing a uniquely East Asian floristic realm, drawing on the plants of Korea, China, and Japan. For the US, the Philippines was the launching pad for botanical work in the Dutch East Indies, Indochina, and Burma, in order to begin conceiving a wider phytogeographic space. Spain, too, saw itself a part of supporting more regional investigations, but we can only speculate what its trajectory may have been in light of 1898 and the role the Philippines would have played. That said, for the final decades of the 19th century, it was the Philippines that put modern Spanish botany on the map, and for the succeeding decades, it would do the same for the US, operating not simply as a periphery or a center, which are rather tried metaphors of the history of science, in my opinion, but as a historical fulcrum. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to your questions.